Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome back to uh, Proteus TV. Um, my name is uh, Josh Bongard. I'm a member of the Proteus team. Um, I'm a professor here at the University uh, of Vermont, and what we're going to do today is I'm going to continue on showing you how to code up uh, virtual robots in virtual environments like the little robot you see uh, on the stream at the moment. So uh, that's who I am. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a member of uh, the Proteus Institute. Uh, the Proteus Institute is uh, a research institute that myself and some other faculty uh, and some students are starting to create. Um, we have a little logo for the Proteus uh, Institute here. Let me just uh, blow it up for you for a moment. Give you an idea of what the Proteus Institute uh, is all about. So uh, in this research institute, um, we're going to be focusing on three different, or we're going to be focusing on three different uh, systems, Proteus systems, Protean algorithms, and Protean machines. First of all, what does Protean mean? Um, Protean is an adjective taken from the Greek god uh, Proteus. Uh, Proteus, uh, he or she was the god uh, or goddess of constant uh, change. And if we consider uh, organisms, all of us, we are protean systems in the sense that we are not a fixed structure or a fixed system. Uh, as organisms, we are constantly changing, constantly editing our internal structure to grapple with the world uh, around us. But of course, our uh, machines and our algorithms are not so much like that. Um, neural networks, which lie at the heart of most modern day artificial intelligence, have a fixed structure uh, like the human brain, but unlike the human brain, the internal structure of these neural networks rarely change. And the robots that we currently make uh, also are pretty brittle. They do not change uh, their shape if a robot or a car or a drone or any physical technology becomes broke, uh, it gets broken, it doesn't physically fix itself uh, to, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't repair itself, grow new legs, uh, heal up scars, uh, grow bigger, grow stronger, and so on. So what the Institute is trying to do is to breathe proteanness into machines and algorithms. And we wanna learn how to do this breathing from organisms which are already very good at it. So that's that's the Institute. Um, again, my name is Josh. For those of you that are just joining the stream, uh, I'm a member of the Proteus uh, Institute, and this is uh, Proteus TV. Uh, we stream once every two weeks now, uh, Fridays, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about coding up. I'm going to show you how to code up virtual robots today. I hope not to talk at you though. Uh, please feel free to type uh, any questions into chat about who I am, what the Proteus Institute is, uh, what I'm doing. Um, if you'd like to uh, have a discussion about robotics and AI um, in general, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, this is sort of an open free uh, time for members of the Institute to connect with you, the general public, and let you know about what we're thinking about and what we're trying to do and give you an opportunity to weigh in, ask questions, contribute your ideas, which hopefully will make its way into the Institute and what the Institute does. Okay, so that's, uh, that's me, uh, that's Proteus. I mentioned Proteus TV, we stream here every other week. Um, we have different guests on uh, every, uh, every stream. Um, we've had a number of guests so far. If you check out, uh, if you check out the About page, if you check out the about page on our Twitter uh, on our Twitch channel here, uh, you'll see we have all of the videos we've recorded so far. So this is episode uh, six um, right now. The video for episode five is still being processed, and you can go back and watch any of the previous uh, four uh, episodes, which, as you can see here, uh, cover a lot of ideas in biology and uh, computer science. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, what are we doing today? Uh, as it says on what here, I'm gonna code up a, a robot for you. And I'm gonna do that by following uh, a massively open online course or MOOC uh, called Ludobots, which you can see down there uh, at the center. Um, Ludobots, as you can see, is run from uh, Reddit. So if you direct your browser to uh, Reddit, Reddit slash R slash uh, Ludobots, you'll find our MOOC. And right at the top of the MOOC here, you'll find a link that says start here. If you click on start here, uh, it'll take you through to uh, installing some software that will 
uh, laid the groundwork for you to start creating virtual bots in, in virtual environments like you see in the right uh, of the stream. Okay, today's episode is a sequel. It's building on from what we did last time. Uh, last time we went through uh, simulation, so creating the virtual world that you see in the, uh, in, you see in the short video to the right. We then went through what links are, and I'll come back and talk about what links are uh, in a moment. And then we're going to continue on today with joints. Joints are things that connect links together. So if you look at the little virtual robot uh, in the right of your screen there, uh, you'll, you'll be, you should be able to count up that that robot is made up of nine parts. Um, in the physics engine that we're using, those parts are referred to as links. Um, links, in my opinion, is an unfortunate name because uh, links kind of suggests things that link things together. You can think about links, robot links here, uh, as sausage links. So they're the actual pieces, and then joints are, uh, so are, are way, ways that we describe how those links are connected together. Okay, so I'm going to just spend a couple minutes now uh, just for the, reminding uh, those of you that were here or weren't here last time what we did, and we'll carry on with what we're going to be doing. Okay, so last time um, we created two Python programs, one called generate.py and another one called simulate.py. What, generate what, what does generate.py do? It generates a file, in this case it was called box.sdf, don't worry about the, the notation for the moment. Uh, it generates this file and saves that file to disk. The simulate.py, the second program, reads in this file, and this file contains information about the world that the robot uh, inherits, uh, in, uh, the world that the robot inhabits. If you look at this uh, image to the right, you'll see there's a gray box there behind the robot. Um, in this case, the robot's, uh, the robot's world is made up of this flat checkerboard floor and one other object, that gray box. So generate.py describes, in this case, nothing more than that gray box. It's read in by this file called simulate.py. And simulate.py, in turn, calls the PyBullet physics engine. If you Google PyBullet, you can go learn much more about this physics engine. PyBullet requires a description of the world stored in box.sdf and simulates uh, that world. Okay, that's what we got to last time. What are we gonna do today? Today, we're gonna work on uh, modifying generate.py, so it outputs two files, box.sdf, or a description of the robot's world and a second file which describes the robot. So everything you see in gray uh, in the video on the right, that's stored in this SDF file, and everything you see in blue, all the stuff that makes up the robot, is stored in this URDF file. Again, we won't worry about these formats now. We're gonna modify simulate.py so that it doesn't just read in box.sdf. We're gonna modify so it also reads in robot urdf and takes information from both files and sends that information to, uh, sends that information to PyBullet, information about the robot and its world. And hopefully we'll finish today by getting PyBullet to give us back information about the robot's motion. So when the simulation finishes, when simulate.py closes down, we want to capture back from that virtual world what happened. And we're going to use that information in part three, which we won't get to today. So again, we got to hear last time. We're going to try and get to hear today. Okay, again, just a reminder, if you have any questions, what are we doing? Please feel free to type it into chat. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Happy to talk about uh, Ludobots, PyBullet, virtual robots, robots in general, AI in general, Proteus Institute. You ask it, I'll answer it. Okay. Okay, so um, let's dive in a little bit more to generate.py. When we finished last time, generate.py was actually not generating a single box, but we were looking at uh, how to get it to generate multiple objects to make up the robot's world. And we actually got it to generate a series of boxes, one uh, stacked on top of the other. So let's go and have a look at generate.py now. 
Um, I'm old, so I use a very old text editor called uh, Vim. Uh, if you don't know what Vim is and you don't know how to use it, you should absolutely learn. Okay, so I'm opening, uh, I'm opening this code here. Uh, this is generate.py. Again, for those of you that saw this last time, this is a little bit of review. Um, we're going to be importing this library. Um, again, if you follow the MOOC, if you follow uh, Ludobots, it'll tell you how to download um, this library from the web. In generate.py, we start creating a file called box.sdf. We then enter into a loop. And every time through this loop, it sends a cube to this file. We're going to send uh, we're going to send uh, nine cubes in Python. Uh, the uh, uh, the iterator iterates up to, but not including ten. So we're going to count from one to nine, and we're going to generate. We're going to call this function nine times. We're going to send nine cubes to box.sdf, and then this call will close this file. Okay, so let's do that. I'm going to run that file, python generate.py. I just get it to write out the names of all the boxes as it sends them to box.sdf. And if I have a look at the files in my directory, we'll see there's a file now called box.sdf, and it was written to disk at 3.11 p.m., and sure enough, it is 3.11 uh, p.m. So we just, running generate.py, created that file. Let's have a look inside that file. You'll notice uh, that it's cryptic. It's written in a particular format that's very hard for uh, the average human to read. Um, this is the information that PyBullet requires. So let me just go back to my slide deck here for a moment. As I mentioned, uh, PyBullet requires a description of the world, the virtual world, in order to simulate it, like you see in the video. Um, we're not going to learn that format. We're using Let's open generate.py again. We're using this particular library, Pyrosim, which hides a lot of that detail from us. Uh, from uh, hides a lot of that detail that we don't have to deal with it. So here's uh, us using the library. Inside that library is a function called send cube, and all we need to tell Pyrosim about the cube is the cube's name, where is it, where is its position in three-dimensional space, and what is its length, height and width. That's the only information we need. You'll notice that PyroSim in turn writes out this box.sdf file. Here's box one. Here is, uh, here is a bunch of information about box one. PyroSim, uh, I'm sorry, the physics engine needs a lot more information about box one than uh, we need to know about. So we're hiding a lot of that detail. Okay. Okay, so now we have box.sdf. If we look at simulate.py, Simulate.py, I'm going to go back to my slide deck here. Remember, simulate.py is reading in this file. So here's simulate.py. Uh, here it is loading in that SDF file. It's also reading in another file which describes the floor. I'm not going to worry about that uh, for now. Uh, reads in this file, and inside simulate.py is another loop that's going to iterate from 0 to 999. And we're going to store that value in time step. So if you look at the if you look at the video above me, um, obviously it's a video, and that video is made up of a series of images or frames. What you can think of simulate doing is sort of simulating this world and stepping through this world. And so each time each pass through this loop is the construction of one frame. When we go to the next loop, that's the construction of the next frame and the next frame, and the next frame, and the next frame. So when we run this program, we're gonna run simulate.py now, we're gonna see a live, uh, we're gonna see a live simulation where every frame in this simulation, every frame in this simulation, every frame in that simulation is one pass through that loop. What you're just watching is a live simulation. What I did, before the stream is run a live simulation and capture video and that's what you're seeing uh, on continuous loop there. So the video above is what we're trying to to create. Okay, so as you saw, I'll play that again, you'll notice that there are a series of boxes stacked one on top of one another. 
And you'll notice also that the boxes are getting smaller and smaller. The boxes are getting smaller and smaller as we, uh, as we add pieces to it. Uh, sorry, the boxes are getting smaller and smaller the higher up in the simulation the boxes are. And you'll notice, and uh, you'll also notice that I am streaming and simulating from the same computer. This is an issue I had last time. I apologize. Uh, you might see a couple of dropped frames in the stream every time I create a simulation. I'm going to try and run it. Uh, I'm going to nice this process. What NICE does is try and tell uh, my operating system that it should run this program, but it should run nicely. It should let everything else uh, take control uh, of the CPU, like uh, the stream itself. Okay, let's see if this helps a little bit. Okay, a little bit. You'll notice, again, this is not an animation. This is a simulation. I'm able to grab and manipulate objects uh, as they fall. Okay, so let's go back and have a look at simulate.py. So, uh, sorry, let's have a look at generate, the file that actually made those 10 boxes. Uh, we create 10 boxes and every, uh, we place them at different heights, a height of one meter, two meters, three meters, four meters. And we set the length, the height, and the width of each box to be smaller at each height. So first time through, height equals one. One divided by one is one. So the length, height, and width of the, block, block, of the block is one. The second block, which is placed at two meters, so the second time through this loop, height equals two. One divided by two is 0.5. So the length, height, and width of the second block is 0.5. The one above that is one divided by three, one divided by four, one divided by five, uh, and so on. That's our series of uh, boxes. Thanks to, uh, thanks, I'm glad to, you think this stream looks cool. Awesome, thank you. All right, a uh, little pep talk there, that's nice. Okay, so let's, uh, let's carry on with the simulation. Um, we've created the virtual world here. We've created a series of boxes. So I'm gonna just modify this a little bit. So we've now created a bunch of boxes. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna rename this file boxes. Python 3, we're gonna generate that. And if I look in my directory, we've got this new file called boxes. We need to modify simulate because we want it to read in this new file called boxes. I run generate.py and then run simulate.py and it'll simulate our boxes. Okay, I apologize. I know this is a little repetitive, just getting this ready. Okay, so now we're going to, we finished creating the robots world. We're going to now create the robot itself. And I'm going to just share a couple slides with you here to give you an idea about where we're going. Um, as you just saw in the simulation, we created a series of nine boxes, one placed uh, on top uh, of the other. We're now going to create uh, a robot which has a very similar structure. We're going to create a robot that's made up of a series of segments where each segment or each cube is placed on top of the other. I'm going to switch from calling these cubes boxes, uh, from boxes to segments because I'm inspired by an organism here. A lot of uh, insects and other animals are made up of a series of segments, rigid segments attached together. This is actually a good way to think about uh, how the robot is built and how it operates inside the physics world. We've got a bunch of these rigid segments. You'll notice that I've placed these little black circles uh, where the segments come into contact with one another. These are, uh, remember that we call these cubes, in the physics engine they're called links. Uh, and we're now going to add in a new idea here, which is joints. Um, and these are, not surprisingly, very much like your knee joint or your elbow joint. They're a description of how two links, imagine my upper arm and my lower arm, are attached together. It says where they're attached and how they restrict the relative motion, how they restrict the relative motion of these two, uh, these two pieces, these two links. So last time we learned about links, um, in, this, uh, in this episode we're gonna learn about joints and we're gonna see how to create a robot that's made up of a series of links. 
The robot in the video above is made up of nine links, and there are eight joints connecting the nine links together. Okay. So let's go back to uh, let's go back to the MOOC uh, Ludobots. As I mentioned, there's a start here. If we click through, we'll see there's a series of lessons, uh, and you can work your way through these uh, at your leisure. Um, we worked our way through uh, links, and we got to uh, we got to many links last time, and we're moving on today to joints. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is define a robot. We're going to define that robot in a different uh, file format than we did the, uh, the world. This is the URDF file. This is a common format used uh, in the robotics community. Um, there's a question here from, uh, I can't pronounce your name. I'll just call you Musa if that's all right. Musa asks, uh, can one joint connect three links together? Um, not, uh, no, a, a joint always connects together two links. Obviously, your elbow connects two links together. It doesn't connect together three uh, links. So if you want to create multiple objects made up of, uh, you want to make a complex robot made up of lots of different links, you need to connect pairs one at a time. Good question. Thanks for that. Okay. So the URDF file um, stands for the Unified Robot Description Format. So this is a file format that describes the physical structure of a robot. One of the cool things about a URDF file is it says nothing about whether that robot is physical or virtual. We could, in theory, sit down with some metal and plastics and try and actually build this robot in reality. And there are some quadruped or four-legged robot kits out there that you can buy that look very much like this. It's very much like uh, this file format describes the anatomy of the robot, where all the pieces are and how they all fit together. And we're gonna actually make an URDF file today. Okay, so we're going to do that by going back to our generate file. And instead of generating this file, we're going to create a new file called robot.urdf. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to refactor my code a little bit here. I'm going to define a function called generate boxes. And I'm going to put all of our code, I'm going to put all of our code in there. Okay, so we've got a function that if we call it, if we call that function, it should create this file. Let's check that that's the case. Yeah. Okay, 3.23 p.m., 3.23 p.m., it just created that file, that's fine. Okay, the reason we're doing that is now we can alter this file easily by telling it, commenting this line out so it no longer generates boxes. Instead, we're going to ask it to generate a robot. Okay, so let's define that function. In many ways, URDF files are like SDF files, but there are important differences. So we're going to use this as inspiration, but make a few changes. First thing we have to do is call the PyroSim library. And it's going to start not an SDF file, but a URDF file. And we're going to call that S uh, URDF file robot. Not very creative. We're going to create that file. We're not going to store any information in that file yet. And we're just going to end, which will, uh, which will finish saving out that file. OK. So uh, we're going to call generate.robot now. And it should run these two lines. look inside our directory and sure enough there is robot.urdf. Uh, we open that file. You can see that there's already a little bit of cryptic information uh, in there. So PyroSim, the library that actually writes out this file, is starting to dump some information in there. We don't have to actually concern ourselves with the details of what's actually inside that file. Let's go back to generate.robot. Uh, we just built in our SDF file a series of stacked boxes. We're now going to try and create uh, a, a segmented robot that's made up of a series of boxes as well. And we're going to call those boxes segments. 
So let's start by creating segment one, just the first, uh, the first part of the robot. You can do so by just, again, copying this line. We're going to send a cube. And we're going to call that cube segment one. This, we're just changing the name of this cube to remind us that this is a little bit different. We're building the robot now, not the world. We're going to place we're going to place that box at 0.5 meters off the ground. So if this is the ground here, height, height, in, uh, height in the physics engine is the Z coordinate. So X is left and right. Y is into the screen and, uh, sorry, is into the screen and out of the screen. And positive values are Z are higher up in the, uh, in the simulator. So there's z equals zero, the floor. We're gonna place, we're gonna place segment one at z equals 0.5 meters above the ground, and the height of the block is one meter. So this should place the block directly on the floor. So far, so good. Again, please feel free to ask any questions uh, if they come up. Okay, so let's check this. Let's generate. Uh, we get, of course, uh, an instant, uh, we get a bug. Oh, right, Le a length, height, and width. Let me actually set those. So the, uh, the block uh, is going to have a length of one, a height of one, and a width of one as well. And we're placing it at 0.5 meters off the ground. Okay, let's see. There's our robot.urdf file. If we look inside, again, it's placed a whole bunch of additional physical information about that cube that isn't going to be of interest to us. We're just ignoring that. We really only care about the size uh, of the cube and where it's placed. Okay. Simulate. Dot, we're now going to uh, read in this robot.urdf file and simulate it. So at the moment, we're reading in the boxes.sdf file. Let's comment that out. We don't want to read in those boxes. We're instead going to read in robot.urdf, and that should be the only change we need to make. Okay, when we simulate this now, we should see one cube call, which is segment one. Okay, there it is. Very good. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's go back to our image here. So we're trying to build this segmented, uh, this segmented robot that's made up of a bunch of rigid cubes stacked one on top of one another, and they're going to be con each neighboring pair is going to be connected by uh, each pair of neighboring cubes are going to be attached by a joint. Let's add segment two, and we're going to add that at we're going to add that at a height of 1.5. One point five meters off the ground. So here's the ground zero point five one one point five. Okay. So we need to alt, we need to modify uh, generate through segment one placed at point five meters off the ground. I'm gonna create segment two. One point five meters off the ground. And we're gonna generate that, and now we're gonna simulate that. Okay, we get a segmentation fault. We get an error. The reason why we get this error is because robots cannot be made up of disconnected, uh, disconnected links. We haven't actually connected segment one and segment two together with, uh, uh, we haven't connected segment one and segment two together with a joint. We're going to do that now. Obviously, organisms are one unified piece. They're connected together by joints and connective tissue and so on. So we're going to add in a joint now. And we're going to do that by going back to our MOOC, Ludobots here, and we're looking at the joints assignment. And uh, again, I'm not going to go through all the details. If you're following along after the stream, you can read all the nitty gritty details in here. Um, we'll see as we scroll down here, there's actually a template for how to create a joint. And we're going to copy this template and fill in some details. Um, we're going to copy this code and we're going to place it in generate.py between our two send cube uh, statements. So let's open up generate.py. Here's our two cube statements and we're going to 
copy and paste paste this line between the two send cube commands. Okay. Okay, so the name of a joint, as you can see here, are two names separated by an underscore. Uh, in the MOOC, it's torso and leg, but we're going to do, we're going to connect segment one to segment two. That's the name of the, the joint. Okay, I'm making the text a little bit smaller. Hopefully, uh, everyone can still see it on stream. Just type something into chat if this is too, if the text is too small, and I'll, I'll reformat my stream here. Okay. So uh, we're creating a joint. Um, this is the name of the joint. And the parent, where the joint originates, is segment one. And the child link, the connecting point, is segment two. OK. So let's bring up our uh, image again of what we're doing. So we've got segment one here, segment two here. This is the parent. This is where the joint starts. And segment two is where the joint ends. These are the two pieces that are being connected together. And the joint, as you can see, is going to live at the intersection point between them. It's readable. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, segment one, segment two. Uh, the, the particular type of joint is called revolute, revolute for revolve. Um, your, your elbow joint is a revolute joint. It allows the two links or the two parts of your body connected to revolve or rotate relative to one another. Later, uh, in a later episode, we'll talk about other kinds of links you can create. And we now have question mark, question mark, question mark. We have to place where the joint goes. We have to tell, tell um, the physics engine where to place the joint. Again, it's going to be placed at the midpoint between segment one and segment two, which as you can see is exactly one meter off the ground. Remember that the segment has a height of one. So I'm just notating this as we go so we want to place we want to place the joint at zero zero one we're going to place segment two at zero zero one point five okay so zero zero one point uh, one so segment one is placed at a height of 0.5 the joint is placed at a height of 1.0 meters and segment two is placed at a height of 1.5 So generate that now. So I've written out to the file robot.urdf three pieces of information, two cubes or two links, and one joint that connects those two links together. I can now simulate those to see what they look like. Hopefully we don't get an error in this case. Aha. There's uh, our two cubes and... They seem to be connected together, but you'll notice something doesn't look right. This is obviously not physically realistic. Something's wrong. But what's wrong is the coordinate system that we're using. And this is a detail of this particular physics engine, uh, PyBullet, that I'm not a fan of, but we work with what we have. What PyBullet does, and I'm going to switch back to, uh, I'm going to switch back to Actually, I'm just, I'll just describe this right here on the slide. What we've been using so far are what are known as absolute coordinates. So in, uh, we're placing segment 1 at x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0. We, place the cent we, tell it the cent we tell the physics engine that the center of segment 1 is at 0, 0, 0.5. The joint is at 1.0. Segment 2 is at 1.5, and so on. It turns out that that's not actually how uh, PyBullet works. PyBullet uses a mixture of uh, absolute coordinates and relative coordinates. I'm going to take a couple minutes to talk about this. It's a little bit non-intuitive. It's not the most interesting part of the physics engine. But if you really want to uh, code up something interesting, you've got to wrap your mind around absolute and relative coordinates. OK, the first, the first link that we place in this file has an absolute coordinate. That was correct. The first joint that we add to uh, we add to the file also has absolute coordinates. It has a height of 1.5. Beyond that, any, any additional links and any additional joints that we add, the coordinates of those additional links and joints are relative 
to the ones that we placed before. Let's have a look at what I mean by that. We placed segment one, we placed a joint. Segment two uh, is going to be connected by, to segment one by this joint. You'll notice that uh, the coordinates here are relative. So the joint, the, the position, the coordinates for this link are relative to the joint that's gonna connect that new object, that new link to the robot. So if I've created my upper arm, I've created my elbow, and I'm creating this new link called lower arm, the position of that lower arm is relative to the joint that's going to connect this new link to the original one. Okay, so what I'm really saying is create segment two and place it 1.5 meters above the joint that's going to connect it to the robot. So the joint has a height of one, of one we're going to place the segment, the center of segment two, 0.5 meters above, the, above that joint. I'll just pause here for a moment. This is a little confusing. Take any questions if there are any. Going once, going twice. Okay. So using my little, uh, my little slide here, my little drawing, we're going to alter the position of segment two position segment two, we originally had its position in global coordinates. We had it placed 1.5 units off the ground. We're going to change it to be 0.5 units or 0.5 meters above the joint that connects it to the growing robot. So far so good? Okay, let's give this a try. We generate that file and then we simulate that file and we now see we have two cubes which are placed directly on top of one another. And if I pull on the upper one, you see that it rotates about a point, which is exactly where these two objects come into contact uh, with one another. Okay. Uh, again, when I simulate and stream simultaneously, it gets a little choppy. So I just I broke out of that simulation. Let's do it again. I'm going to simulate that file again. Maximize this here so we can see this a little better. And if I pull on the upper cube, you can see that it rotates relative to the lower cube. Okay. Any questions about that before we carry on? So far, so good? Okay. So let's, let's continue on. Let's keep adding segments. Let's make a worm standing upright. That, that worm or that, uh, this hypothetical insect is going to be made up of a series of rigid segments attached by joints. So I'm going to now create, I'm now going to create uh, a new segment, segment three. I'm going to now create a, a, a new segment, segment three. Segment three is also going to have uh, relative coordinates, and again, it's relative to the joint that was. Uh, it's relative to the joint that connects it to the rest of the growing body. So it's again 1.5 me. It's 0.5 meters above the joint that connects segment three to the rest of the body. So let's add in segment three now. Okay, segment three is going to be placed at 1.5 meters above the joint that connects segment three to segment two. We haven't created that joint yet. So let's create that, jo that joint. So we're creating this new joint here that connects segment two to segment three. So we'll name it that to remember it. So we wanna connect segment, uh, segment two, segment three, and the position of that joint of this new joint is also relative. Oops. Is that right? Let's try that again. The position of this, the position of this joint is also relative and it's relative to the previous joint. This is very, uh, very confusing. So this joint uh, is one point is one meter above the previous joint. 
Okay, so segments, their positions are relative to the joint that connects them to the growing body. New joints, their position is relative to the joint that's upstream from them. Yeah, so if you think about my elbow, it is upstream from my shoulder joint. So I might define my shoulder joint in absolute coordinates and the downstream joint, its position is relative to the upstream joint. Okay, takes a bit of getting used to. Um, another question from Yuza here, does it matter if we change the order of the creation of joints and cubes? For example, writing uh, send cube before send joint. Let's, uh, let's give that a try. So let me just back up for a moment. Good question, let's see what happens. Okay, I'm just gonna comment these out. So we're just gonna go back to creating two cubes and two joints. Let's see what happens if we, as Musa asks, let's create the two cubes first and then the joint and see what happens. The answer is I actually don't know what happens. Let's see what happens. Let's see if it's okay with that. Okay, PyroSim seems to be okay with that. Uh, so go ahead and uh, call them in whatever order you want. So you can create a whole bunch of uh, cubes and then connect them together with joints. The reason I like to alternate is again because of the fact that joints and links are relative to the ones that were created before them. So when I'm creating a robot, I like to create it from the inside out. So we're gonna create the robot above. We probably won't have time to do that today. We might do that next time. Is uh, again, we're moving outward and at, when we create the first, the first link and the first joint, those have absolute coordinates. And then as we move outward from there, the new, uh, the new pieces, their coordinates are relative to the ones before. Okay, so uh, we're adding this new joint and this new cube. Segment two, uh, this joint connects segment two to segment three, and its position is 1.0 meters above the upstream joint, which is this joint. And segment three has a position that's 0.5 meters above its upstream joint, which is this joint. Just jump back and forth here, right? So this new joint is 1.0 meters above its upstream joint. And this new link is 0.5 meters above its upstream joint. Let's give this a try and see what happens. Okay. So if I pull now, you should notice that we now have three segments and those joints are exactly where we expect them to be at the midpoint between these neighboring uh, links. Okay, again, it's, it takes a little bit. Um, so for those of you that are coding along or want to code along after, like I was doing here, I would create a, a drawing and fill in the coordinates of that drawing while you're coding so you get a sense of how this, how this works. Okay, so like we did last time, what we just did is manually create, cu we're creating cubes and segments, uh, sorry, we're creating links and joints manually. Let's change this and do this uh, in a procedurally generated way, which means we're gonna create a loop. And every time through that loop, we're gonna add, we're gonna add a, a link and connect it with a joint to the growing robot. Uh, actually, so let, let's, yeah. So the first, the, first Q, the first link and the first joint have absolute coordinates. And then the next ones, uh, the next ones here have uh, have these relative coordinates. So let's create a for loop here. Um, segment index equals. Uh, actually, we should be able to do this. Let's see. I'm just thinking here for a moment. Oh yeah. Okay. So you'll notice that these two lines, if we look at the coordinates here. They're the same as the coordinates in these two lines. So if we just keep repeating these pairs of lines, we can add a new segment and add it to the joint uh, before it. So instead of copying and pasting this pair of lines over and over again, let's put these pair of lines inside a for loop. Two, we're gonna start at two because we're gonna create segment two. 
segment two through segment 10. Sorry, let me switch from C to Python. Okay, so we've got, uh, we're gonna now repeat this pair. Um, we're gonna repeat this from two to nine, which should create our nine segments that we have here. We now need to go through and change a few things. So the name of the joint, joint name, it was originally segment, segment one, segment two, but now we need to use segment index. So segment index the first time through this loop is two, two minus one is one, segment one connects to segment I'm just going to comment these lines out and make sure that I got the name right. Okay, right. So there's the second joint being created. Uh, sorry, the first joint being created, second, third, fourth, and so on. That looks good. Okay, so the joint name is correct. Actually, let's change this. We need actually the parent, the name of the parent link. Parent link name is originally segment one. And the child link name was originally segment two. Feel free to stop and ask if you have any questions. Uh, and we need to change this. So we're going to use the segment index. Minus one, first time through the loop, segment index is two, two minus one is one, segment one, segment two. And then joint name was originally segment one, segment two. So we can replace this with parent link name. link name. Okay, let's check that we got that all right. Okay, joint one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Okay, so now we can uncomment the sending of the joints. We're going to send the joint name. The parent is called Parent link name, child is called child link name. Every time, all of the joints are revolute joints, and every time every joint is placed one unit above the previous, uh, the previous one. Okay. Cube two, uh, send cube segment two. That's the child link name. And every time it's placed 0.5 meters above the joint, that's going to connect it to the growing robot. And we want every cube or every segment to have a length of one, <coughs> width of one, a height of one, and width of one. Just get rid of these lines, clean things up a little bit. Okay, so we create an original, uh, an original segment, and then pairs of joints and cubes, attaching them as we go. We're going to generate robot.urdf, which should now have a description of nine links, uh, nine segments, nine links, and eight joints connecting pairs of neighboring links together. Okay. And we should be able to see that we now have a worm, a segmented worm, where we have 10 pieces all connected together by links. Let's just run that one more time so you can see that.
Okay, so um, we have a, a segmented worm robot now, which obviously looks quite different from our quadruped that we see above. Uh, we have 10 minutes left, so I don't think I'm going to uh, start in on anything new today. I think we'll pause here. So just to wrap up, um, what I've shown you is the difference between uh, specifying uh, between specifying uh, the world that the robot virtual robot is going to inhabit, we, uh, where all the description of the world is stored in SDF. We looked at that last time. Um, the world is made up of a series of, uh, of pieces or objects, which are uh, links. We look today at uh, building a robot, and a robot differs from the environment in the following way. The robot is also made up of a series of physical objects, which are known as links. But those links must be attached together with joints that restrict how objects move relative to one another. Uh, we can get very fancy with different kinds of joints uh, to specify revolute joints like our elbows, uh, our elbows and knees. Uh, you can create ball and socket joints like your shoulder, which restrict how objects move relative to one another. You can also create pistons, which uh, causes objects to ex push away and into one another, but they cannot rotate relative to one another. We'll spend some time uh, in a future episode talking uh, about those. Um, stepping back, um, I will be back on the stream uh, probably in about six weeks' time um, with part three, where we'll start to add uh, sensors and motors to our robot so it can start to move on its own, like the robot you see above. Um, if you check out the about, uh, if you check out the, if you check out the about tab uh, on our uh, Twitch page here, you can find previous episodes, um, which have all been recorded. You can go watch those uh, on YouTube, and uh, we're recording this stream, which I'll post here. So if you only tuned in partway through, through you can go back and watch today's stream, which in turn builds on uh, episode one. Um, we will be back in two weeks' time uh, with another member of the Proteus Institute, um, which will be uh, another member of the Proteus Institute, who will uh, give you additional insight into uh, how exactly the Proteus Institute works, what we're doing, and how we're trying to connect together uh, biology, robotics, and artificial intelligence. Um, unless there's any last burning questions for me, I wish you a good rest of your Friday. Have a great uh, weekend, and we'll see you back here in two weeks' time at Friday, uh, Friday at 3 p.m. Bye-bye, everyone. Until next time.